I could try to move a little bit closer to the um, to the source, see if we get a better signal that way. Unless you, I'm not digitizing, then I won't move. You're, you're, you're fine right now. You're fine. Okay, great. You too. All right. Give me one second. We're going to fire this bad boy up. Great. Be just like two pals catching up. Yep. So you want to know what my first thought was going through your reel there, John? Mm. Uh, you never had hair. <laughs> well, I lost my hair at 20. So 20, I started losing my hair at 20. So by the time I was 24, I had just shaved my head because what's the point? Right. But you've got this very distinctive, whatever this is called that you have, right? It's called male pattern baldness. It's Correct. old. It's, it's, so, it's pretty old. Right. So the first time a lot of people see you on screen or think they know you on screen is old Norm, son of a Gunderson, right? And there you are. And this is 96 now yeah. going way back. And I'm like, he had that same haircut <laughs> that he yeah, has today. Much. I've, I've actually, ironically, I've lost hair. <laughs> you know, I'm at the point where um, I can use the word, I can use hairs. That's, that's, you know, you know, you're losing your hair when you can make it a plural. <laughs> um, but, you know, if someone, if someone wants you, right, if someone wants mm -hmm. to hire you, right, they know mm -hmm. you've got the goods, right, uh, acting wise, and then there's like, all right, so physically, sort of this guy, but then it's like a series of let's add hair and mustaches to this guy because he's got this is what he this is what he looks like. For a long while, you know, um, when I would go into auditions for uh, parts, I would say, I think this character has hair and they would go well, um, we, no, we like you just the way you are. And I'm like, uh, thank you. I don't take having no hair as something that's wrong with me, but I appreciate your, your kind words. I just think this character should have hair. And there's a bunch of examples of that that I've tried to do over the years. And a lot of times what, what you run into is hair is a line item, you know, that they didn't budget for. Really? You know, a really nice wig can run six grand and then you have to have somebody who's actually good at it to put it on right you know and uh those two line items can talk a talk a production out of getting it but but now i'm at a point where a lot of times i'm hired and i come in like i did with 1984 last year and um and they had a particular look in mind you know uh and then they they uh create to that look um um mike mccash who is the special effects artist on uh on American Horror Story, um, sent me a mock-up of the character with the broken glasses and the and the uh, the redded out eye and the mullet, and um, and I was like, when did you take this picture and when did I put this on? That's how good it's getting. It looked like me wearing it, and when I put it on, I looked exactly like the mock-up. Well. Yeah, so it's stuff that like the normal person like myself might not uh, think about. Um, so I think I've told you I'm, I'm friends with Mark Marin, and he just mm -hmm. filmed something down here. I'm in Atlanta um, where he plays this uh, older music producer, and he's already got, you know, Mark has got, you know, the hair and the yeah, beard. and the, he looks like Mark Marin. He looks like Mark Marin, but they wanted to give him this thing, and it was going to be like hours in the chair every day, or he'd cut his hair, which he couldn't do because he has glow coming back up. And, um, you know, an extra two hours up early in the chair does not sound like fun, but I think they ended up not doing it. But, you know, um, listen, um, I know actors aren't supposed to complain because it's a great job and blah, blah, blah. But listen, if I have to get up at 3 a.m. instead of 5 a.m., I'm not happy about that, right? Yeah, but the, the whole point of what I started doing this for was to transform. I didn't want to be me, man. I mean, <laughs> who would want to be me, <laughs> you know? So like from the time I was 14 years old, I was trying to do transformation. I, I mean, I, it's funny, you know, when I was, I think it was 17 when I did a production of Arsenic and Old Lace and I spent 90 minutes with uh, the director who's also a makeup artist, uh, my friend KQ in, in Denver doing, um, you know, makeup. So I looked like Boris Karloff, you know, I mean, I, I mean, these, these things are, uh, are, uh, what I wanted in the first place was to transform. So, um, but what I found over the course of time is that the transformation is much more interior than exterior and, and uh, how it affects the way in which you, uh, how the material affects you 
is both in a physical transformation and uh, and a, and an emotional one. And so those two things dance together. But I still love to put on the wigs and the mustaches and everything like that. I mean, there's a look that I'm sad. Right? I'm partly sad the show didn't go because I would have loved to work with Paul Giamatti every day. But we did a pilot, and man, I looked fantastic. I had this great like sweep sweep blonde hair across my head with a mustache and it was a 70s show i looked like fucking john holmes <laughs> and was it was it, it didn't go no uh -oh. what was it about it was called hoke and it's uh, based on books uh that are about this character it's such a fantastic character and it was such a fantastic pilot but i think that the powers that be were like yeah but i mean this is this is a depressing world to be in and uh, Paul was so great in the pilot, so terrific. He, um, the character is a is a ninth, in mid seventies um, uh, Miami Police Department, right when the police department is trying to bring in more Cubans and Latinos, and and so the cars and the whole world. It starts the the pilot started in a hurricane with a guy coming into Hoke's room where he he lives in an elderly care center. Um, he's not old, but he's gotten this, he's gotten this address so he can still stay in the district and not spend a lot of money. Right. So he's in this elderly care center and a guy comes in trying to shoot him and there's a gunfight with, uh, Hoke and Paul's character and this, this guy in the middle of this hurricane. And the whole thing was Paul Giamatti naked in a gunfight. <laughs> it was fantastic. So funny. And then he runs out in the middle of a hurricane, naked in the middle of a hurricane after this guy. It was terrific. So, you know, I'm curious, you do, you, you've done so much stuff and there are certain shows that you're on for, you know, an episode. And I wonder mm -hmm. if you look at that or two episodes, if you look at that as uh, like to get in the groove as it were, right? If you're playing a guy over the course of days or weeks, right? You, 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 mm -hmm you're especially if you are putting on the makeup and everything you're sort of getting into that groove daily but if you just got to come on and deliver in a hurry is that harder for you Do you look at that as a like a challenge guest star parts on television are the i mean gen, in general the worst jobs in the world <laughs> because they um it's a moving train right i mean right. production is like a train this is the way i look at production and the whole thing is that there's a the, there's pre-production, which is the people who are laying the track down. There's production, which is steaming ahead. Um, and then there are people in post-production who are picking, picking up the track and running around and putting it back in front. That's how it works. You know, the production is still working. So you come on a set for one day or two days, you know, you're, you're being asked to, uh, you know, deliver in very short order. And it's a very difficult job. And unless the regular actors and the producers are very good hosts, you know, make you feel at home, support you. It can be a very cold environment because especially later on when people get tired, you know, in the sixth, seventh, eighth seasons of things, um, it can get it can get hard to get on a set because there's nobody, you just walk in and they go, okay, yeah. So we're gonna go over and uh, have you, uh, you're gonna sit in this chair and then you're gonna cry, okay? <laughs> and it would be great if you didn't spend any time on it because we've got, man, right. we've got like six more pages today. So uh, right. great. Um, so it's really, it's really nerve wracking, but over the course of time, there are things that I've done, uh, in the last few years that were one-offs, you know, uh, a handmaid's tale and, uh, and, uh, uh, the walking dead where the writing was so good and the, uh, and they came on shows that I admire. You know? And, um, Oftentimes, you think to yourself, if you're fortunate like I have been, um, well, am I gonna am I gonna waste this show's interest in me on just one episode? Like, you know, as a mercenary, you go, could we make it six? Could we make it six episodes so I can, you know, get my health insurance or whatever? Right. But uh, but you know, I've stopped kind of doing that. If I respond to the writing and and uh, and they, you know, they we agree on the fact that I should do it. Um, then uh, I, I try to find time if there's time to do it. Uh, but the show has to be good. And in both of those cases, they're both excellent shows. So you're saying there has been times, you don't have to name names unless you want to, 
um, mm -hmm. <laughs> where they're just like, yeah, John, okay, love your work. Hey, listen, so do X, Y, Z. And then like, God forbid you need a second take. And they're like, dude, come on. We got like, come on. Trains moving. No, it's Let's go. Never, it, it's never, it's never been that, it's never been that bad. And particularly later on, you know, there's a, you know, there's a level of, um, you get to be known in the process of it. Like when I first started out, that's, that's how it felt, you know, um, that, uh, I mean, when I first did the first few, few things I did, like I did an episode of a show called the visitor and I mean, essentially the guy, as many of my parts are, they, he was unhinged, you know, he had spent, uh, years in an insane <laughs> well, what does that say? What is that? Are we going to walk right over that? What does that say about you? It just says I'm basically unhinged. I mean, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm available for my own madness, I guess. I don't know. I mean, uh, I've played a lot of people who are, I've pretended to kill a lot of people, Matt. <laughs> um, I've, pre I've pretended to kill dozens, dozens of people. Maybe that should be uh, on your last... reel. Maybe on your reel, you should be like total confirmed kills or something like that. The um, last year when I was doing American Horror Story, um, I was sitting on the set talking if I who was with, with Leslie Grossman, maybe, but it was like, how many, how many times have I died? Let's, let, let, and I made a list of the ways in which I died, which, which by the way, that last year of American Horror Story, um, you know, no, uh, there's a lot of spoilers in this, but you know, I added to my total of, of being killed in the show. And, um, and, you know, I've been uh, stabbed in the chest several times. I've, burst into flames i got drugged burst into flames and shot melted in lava you know i've died a lot but then i was like but how many people have i killed and it's almost the same it's i've died as many times as i've killed people so i figure you know as long as i keep that ratio 50 50 i'm doing I'm doing okay well, d does anybody else how about the uh zodiac and john wayne gacy thing right that's is that's going to be like a short company right yeah well, I mean, there's there's not a lot of people who've played uh, several live, several real life serial killers. I can't think of anybody. I don't know. I mean, well, the guy got to play Manson twice. That one guy did. Railsback, Steve Railsback. Did he get to play twice? The well, he's he was on he was on what do you call it? Um, Mindhunter, Man and then Hunter? he played oh, it, and then he did once it upon in a time. And, yeah. Okay. Well, good. Good for him. But I think playing um, two different ones is kind of cooler. Well, thanks. I, I, I've always appreciated the feeling of playing people who've actually killed people as cool. Right. Um, you know, uh, the, it's interesting. The Gacy one was hard to let go of. Uh, the the um, Arthur was different. Uh, Arthur Lee Allen was different only insofar as I think there's a certain level of plausible deniability that he did it at all. And certainly that was the way in which I was asked to play the part. But um no doubt that Gacy did it, no doubt. And when you watch videos of him, which I did to get his accent, because he has a really strong Chicago accent, a uh, very specific, specific way of doing it, um, uh, sp ways of speaking, he's so believably innocent. It's terrifying. It's terrifying. Well, you and I have talked prior to this conversation about the Zodiac stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. One of my favorites, can watch it. It's so fucking long, but I feel like I, I rewatch it all the time and it just always, it never seems to take, but it's, it's like three hours plus, right? Uh, I think it's like two forty. Right. So long movie. So yeah, good. Long. And when you say, and I know there were multiple people that played the voice, et cetera, but when you say you were given the direction to make it ambiguous or you were given the direction that like, what was the direction? No, uh, uh, David was quite specific. He was like, "I, y you need to play this character as if he didn't do it." As if he didn't do it. Yeah. You you have to you have to play this character as if he didn't do it. But <laughs> and that's what I did. Well, d dare I say that? And if I was, would I be here talking to you? Is awfully fucking chilling for a guy that didn't do it. Yeah, it sure is. It sure is. And those are directly from the transcripts. Those are words he actually said. They took contemporaneous notes during the uh, interview, and that's what he said. That scene is almost word for word from the contemporaneous notes, I believe. It's um, chilling. You know, like he just volunteers the fact that he killed chi the blood in his car was from chickens he killed. I right. mean, it's. Oh, those it's are some insane. chickens I killed. <laughs> yeah. 
I think that, you know, uh, what I came to believe about uh, Arthur Lee Allen was he wanted them to believe he was the Zodiac. And made him feel important. Uh, and, um, and that's the way in which those lines kind of subconsciously, I think, were, were uh, I, I tried to play them. But um, those four actors, uh, the, the four actors I worked with in those scenes, Marty Lodge and uh, and Anthony Edwards and Mark and uh, and Mark Ruffalo and Elias Kateas, those that was like sitting down with a spectacular jazz combo. So you didn't really have um, you didn't really have to worry about anything, and um, you had time because you knew you were going to get millions of takes, and you knew that uh, Fincher's notes were going to be excellent because you know he's a he's one of those rare uh, directors who can uh, with uh, with uh, his understanding of the material facility of language be so uh, ev evocative. So everybody has a sense not only of what they're uh, being asked to do, and just in my experience, but also uh, has a has a metaphoric feeling or understanding of what the scene is supposed to feel like. Uh, he does it. He does that very, very well, I think. A scene like that, when you're talking about these great actors, Again, for you, is it is it general sort of excited nerves that you always get? Is it do you put pressure on yourself? Like, are you are you a guy that gets motivated by, I, I you know now the stakes are raised because I'm in you know not that you diss other actors. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. I'm, well, I mean, you're given like uh, uh, let's say let's say you're 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 going to go to a meal, right? And <laughs> you go to a you go to a really, really nice restaurant. It's a good restaurant and you enjoy the meal. And then you go to another restaurant then, and you know the reputation of the restaurant. And it's, it's like you're, you're going to the French Laundry in Napa Valley. Your excitement about that meal is gonna be up because you've heard, and not only that, in the case of these actors, you've seen their work and how fine it is, how, pure, how, uh, how uh, supple and how impressive it all is and so you're you're you know that you're going to be asked to play uh, at as fine a level as you can get and that's that's the goal you know that's the goal but it's not that you go to the other restaurant thinking oh this meal is going to suck you know right you're going to that restaurant to enjoy the meal and i do right you know and and what's so fun is when I'm working with someone uh, for the first time and I, I'm not familiar with their work because they're not in a position, I'm not in a position to know their work by my own ignorance or by, um, uh, or by the fact that they're generally new uh, and suddenly you're, you're you like you would at a restaurant, you know, you go to a restaurant you've heard is good and you go in and it's the best goddamn meal you've ever had and you're just thrilled by it. And that's the kind of joy that, that uh, working with other actors uh, do but see I'm like uh, you know uh, you know those old you know when you I, I I play pick I used to play pickup basketball every Sunday but I don't anymore because I'm in the country and there's nobody to play with also yeah, I don't know if you know that but you know anyway that you used to play um, basketball or that you live in the country I used to play no that I that I were on quarantine oh <laughs> um, uh, anyway um uh, you know, there's all the, always the old guys, like, you know, old guys who like are on the fence just watching pickup games, you know, like they can't run anymore, but they're, they love the game so much and it doesn't matter what level it's being played at. And that's kind of how I feel about acting. I, I just, I love the process of it. I love the, the way in which people do it. And it doesn't really matter at what level they're doing it at. I am fascinated by the, by the um, agreement um with the audience that we'll agree that you're someone else for some period of time we'll all agree that that's true and you'll agree to be that other person for some period of time for purpose and and that we all do that i've been fascinated by that since i was i don't know probably since before i could even name it but certainly since i was 14. And what, what happened at 14 that made this magical thing? Oh, I mean, for you? you know, I, I think for me, the first conscious thought of it, I've told this story a lot. My, 
My brother was a senior in high school. He had a really good voice. Uh, my brother still does have a really good voice, but he was playing one of the nights in a production of Camelot. And my other older sister was on the crew. So, uh, and it was it was a really good high school production of Camelot. Anyway, I went, and um, my brother comes out at the beginning of one of the three nights who sing Camelot, the 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 introduction song. And um, he walks out in, you know, you know, what a high school production of medieval looks like. And um, I just go, oh, he's a knight. And I, I mean, I just suddenly had, you know, mental reverb. I'm like, wait a minute. No, he's my brother, Dan. How can he be a knight? Like, how can that? How did I just simply agree? How did I just simply agree? Yes, you're a knight now because you said you were. How, how, how did that happen? I know you're not a knight. And that trip that it felt like a magic trick you know and uh that was so fascinating to me i mean i was already you know um i was already into a deep understanding of pretend as a child i loved that but but this brought it to another level and uh if you add to that my own sense of self-hatred <laughs> And, and my sense of, you mean I could be someone else for some period of time? You mean I could be someone else than this person I just can't stand? That right. sounds awesome to me. Right. How do I, I'll sign up right now. <laughs> that's, but, that's kind of how it happened. And, and you, you grew up where? Either Denver or Minnesota? Where'd you grow In up? Denver. Denver. I, I knew it was one of the two. And, and why was it so horrible in 1970, whatever? Oh. It wasn't, you know, it was family issues, you know, uh, you know, things that are, you know, both my parents are dead and these are not unusual issues for Irish Catholic families. There's a lot of drinking involved. There was a lot of, there was a lot of family angst and anxiety. There were, there were presentations of self because my father was a politician that didn't make any sense that the madness in our house was somehow papered over whenever we went outside, like, oh, now we're perfect. And I don't understand how we're doing this, why we're all agreeing to this this kind of charade and then it explodes you know as those families do and they exploded and both my parents ended up in you know recovery and uh gratefully and uh both of them died sober and uh, there was a lot of healing and uh, a lot of that but but at the court at the time of when i was 13 14 years old i really needed an out uh, i i had a lot of rage issues and a lot of other things uh, i don't know I, you're probably surprised matt that uh, from my work that I have a rage issue. Um, uh, <laughs> but uh, yeah, I mean, I, uh, I had a lot of, uh, I, had, I, was a, I was a very physically violent kid and I had uh, gotten some, uh, you know, I, I don't think it was state uh, sanctioned, but it was, I mean, it was certainly ele in elementary school that when I was in fifth grade and sixth grade, I went to a group called Red Circle, which was for the troubled kids. And it would be like you'd get a separate period to go over and sit with, you know, it was like there was a counselor in the library and the, you know, five or six of us who had exhibited really violent tendencies were, were, um, were asked to sit and to, I don't remember exactly what we did, but it was definitely, now that I look back at it, it was definitely like, you have to stop beating people up. You, you, let's try to keep you from beating people up. Let's do that. So, um, uh, you know, obviously there was a lot of uh, acting out that was happening, emotional acting out. Well, d dare I say you've actually just given me a lot of hope. Um, my middle child, Jackson, who I'm the closest to, who I love the most, you're not supposed to have a favorite kid, but I do, um, is, is kind of a violent kid. I mean, he's, he's, he's not killing animals, but he definitely... You know, f first of all, I know that typically among siblings that can happen, right? Big brother beats up little brother, but he definitely, um, we hope he's quote unquote grows out of it or, or matures or learns how to deal with his emotions better. But uh, I I'm going to say that to Stacy later. I'll be like, well, listen, he, he could grow up and be John Carroll Lynch and that guy turned out okay. So there you go. Um, well, I've, I've, I've broken a lot of eggs over the, <laughs> over the years. I well, listen, who, who, who but hasn't? Who hasn't? No, who hasn't? I mean, we're. We've, we've, we all have a little hitch in our get along by this point. And, uh, I, I, I just feel like, um, you know, um, I'm so grateful that that uh, uh, group was there and I didn't even know how much it had helped me until later on. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, you know, I stopped physically fighting people around 13 years old, you know, 
And then uh, this uh, theater thing came along and I just, uh, you know, I sucked the marrow out of it. I, uh, I was, a, I was, I quit football. I went to do musicals and, um, and I uh, just, uh, musicals and straight plays and whatever I could get in for the next four years. Other than your brother, um, was there someone on your television or movie theater experience that you were like, if I could be half as good as that guy, I'll, I'll be really happy? I never imagined doing films, really. Uh, I mean, I, I, that was not really how I looked at it. I didn't think to myself, oh, I want to be them. You know, like I want, I want, I wish I were as good as they were. I never thought of it that way. Um, uh, I never thought of it that way. Um, like you didn't want to be De Niro or anything? Oh, no, there were people I adored, you know, people I absolutely found, you know, mostly, mostly, com mostly comedic actors, you know, Gene Wilder and, uh, and uh, Cloris Leachman and, uh, you know, mostly, um, you know, Mel Brooks movies were the ones that really, I mean, I, I, we, I don't know why my parents did this, but we went to a lot of, uh, you know, classic films. Uh, retro houses in Denver, the Bluebird and the Vogue, and they would have retro uh, movies and we would go to see them, you know, so like I would see, I don't know, when I was 10 years old or nine years old when I first saw the Marx Brothers, for example, and and uh, and uh, saw, you know, it happened one night and gone with the wind on the big screen. And, you know, I mean, it was something that my parents seemed to do on uh, a, a lot of regularity. And then when multiplexes came out and I was going to see the same movie 18, 19, 20 times, it was often uh, you know, the ones that are obviously the most famous from the period I'm talking about, which is, you know, the 70s. So, I, you know, I saw Jaws, I don't know, maybe 10 times and I saw Raiders of the Lost Ark five or six. And uh, but I also saw, I mean, the ones I saw over and over again, <laughs> interestingly enough, were like all the Mel Brooks movies. I mean, I must have seen Blazing Saddles 20 times. I saw, um, you know, uh, Young Frankenstein, I don't know, close to that. And interestingly enough, another movie that I saw over and over and over again was a movie that was a complete failure, which was Paint Your Wagon. Like I saw Paint Your Wagon at least a dozen times. It was at the Cooper Theater, which was a 70 millimeter theater uh, in Denver. It was the only, I think it's the only place that played. It played for a year there. It was a complete failure. I mean, uh, you know, Clint Eastwood in a musical was not a great choice. <laughs> um, as much as he loves music, it was not a great choice. Uh, Lee, you know, when you go, here's the guys we want singing, Clint Eastwood and Lee Marvin. This is going to be awesome. Right. But uh, I loved that movie. I thought it was terrific. I just loved everything about it. Well, I, so when VHS was invented, were you like, this is awesome. I can finally watch this stuff in my house. I don't have to actually, or were you like, oh, I'd rather yeah. see it on the big screen. No, no. I, no, I watched everything. I mean, I watched, I, I watched things on the, I watched things on VHS. I watched things on cable television. I watch, I watch a lot of things. I like to have stories told to me. And, um, and I, I continued to go to the theater. And, uh, and when I, when I first started thinking of myself as an actor, I was like, well, I'm going to be on stage. That's what I'll do because that's what's accessible to me. I right. didn't think that films were at all accessible, that, that they just weren't even, I didn't even think of them as the same thing. And I went to university uh, in DC and uh, got a Bachelor of Fine Arts degree. And my intention was to work in the theater. And I started working in the theater. I, I, I started working almost immediately um, as an understudy in DC and then moved to Chicago and started getting into the community there. And then was uh, asked to join the, the Guthrie Touring Company from Minneapolis. And then I spent the next eight years, probably the most formative years of my life as an actor with a group of about 25 of the best actors I've ever worked with um, on stage doing repertory theater and um, six shows a year. When you talk about the restaurant analogy, mm -hmm. how does that work when you get to work with Clint Eastwood? Well, um, you know, the great part about Clint Eastwood is like, it's like going to Musso and Frank's, right? You know, you know everybody's told you every story about the time they've been to this iconic restaurant. Oh, you should, you know, wow. Uh, I, you know, if you get a chance to go there, be sure you order this, or this is going to be the experience, you know, and uh, over and over again, I was told, you know, it's, he's one take, he moves on. And I <laughs> would watch his work in, in that kind of way. And I, I, I began to realize that, you know, there were things that he was interested in. He really is a jazz music, musician. That's what he really is. 
he wants one take. Like I, I watched this thing the other day online. Um, who was it? Somebody sent it to somebody who was, was on somebody's Twitter feed. I think it was Wendell Pierce's Twitter feed. And I think it was Miles Davis. Miles Davis was hired to do a, a, um, a, a score for a movie and he watched a rough cut. And then he uh, was brought into the stage with two, two people. He had notes uh, written for them and for himself and they played it in one take. That was it, one take. So he wants, to, he wants that experience, he wants that energy. He's not interested in some other energy. He's not interested in refinement. He's interested in what you wanna do. And so I was ready for that. And then I have a scene with him where there's four pages of dialogue and we're getting tons of takes. You know, we're doing three, four, five takes. We're ad-libbing, you know, it was completely opposite to what uh, I was told. I, I meant more the concept of uh, you know, the 15 or 20 year old version that's watching Paint Your Wagon. And then one day you're sitting across the set from, you know. Oh, I see. From I think they're essentially you know, God. You know, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. it's just. You know, what's funny is that, you know, I, I got the offer to do that piece. And, um, you know, I went in and read for it and uh, put myself on tape for it and, uh, with the casting director. And I got the offer and I had, I had learned all of, you know, I had uh, learned all about his work, how people work with him. And I had just, it was the same summer that I'd worked with Martin Scorsese. So I think I'd kind of gotten over the, you know, like he's an icon thing at that moment. Like the Scorsese thing was freaky. Really? But, the, but for whatever reason, Clint Eastwood didn't freak me out. I don't know why. He should have, but he didn't. Um, and I want to get back to Scorsese, but let's, I do want to talk about, so Fincher is like a hundred takes, right? Well, yeah, he, I think, I, I mean, he said this in interviews that he likes to wear people out, you know, uh, he, and, right. uh, yeah. Which, which, because he thinks I'm going to get a certain performance from whoever, if I'm going to get to the, what's really fucking going on, because we're going to go through, right? Yeah, I think he, he tries to. I mean, this is what he said. I don't know what the real intention is. I think uh, he tries to get to a point where you 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 no longer have the energy to do any acting. Right. And um, uh, and I, I mean, I, I think it's an interesting uh, way of looking at it. Uh, I, you know, I, I started in the theater doing rep and working with a wide variety of directors who had different styles of directing. And you're the one who has to make the, um, you're the one who has to make the adjustment because these directors don't work with other directors and think, oh, maybe there's another way of working. They, they're having a conversation with their, you know, with their actors, but they don't really change the way in which they do things for you. You change the way you do things for them. So when I got to uh, Fincher, it felt like rehearsal, just, you know, like a very long rehearsal for the scene. And I never felt, uh, I, I totally understood the process that he was going by. But I think he can freak a lot of people out because they start to think what was wrong with all the other ones. Like um, when I directed Harry Dean in, in Lucky, uh, if I got, I got one take, if I asked him for another, he goes, what was wrong with the first one? Right. Like sounds like an old, sounds like an old actor. Doing. That's what old actors yeah. say, right? Yeah, exactly. So, uh, um, you know, you'd have to, you had to earn every take. And I think people, you notice how I got two different drinks. There's, there's also no one over here. I'm going to show you later. What do you got? Later. I got my coffee and my water. That's it. I have a coffee and I didn't have time to get a water. Oh, um, <laughs> I was running behind. I didn't want to make you wait. Um, yeah. So, so was that so was that one whole day that uh, that work scene that interview at the at the a day and a, it was a day and a half actually and and, half. and if it doesn't bother you too much to get this into it uh is it just the actual acting part that he shoot like he didn't shoot you walking into the room 10 times did he uh i don't remember it you know they watch they watch now. you right they watch yeah, you yeah, kind yeah. of I don't remember doing that in an inordinate amount of times, but you know, you, you, you know, you're going to be in it uh, for a long while. I mean, that's the thing, but the, the thing about that particular group of four, uh, you know, the four of us at the table, uh, Marty as well, but more the four of us at the table because we spent more time together was uh, Marty plays the manager who brings me in. 
um, anyway, the four of us sat down and by the end of a day and a half of like, I mean, I don't know how many takes in each setup, but you know, I don't know. We've done the scene maybe 70 times. I don't know. Wow. Wow. And more than that, probably. I don't remember, but, but, uh, um, it was, we all got up and said, we should really, that was, I feel more energized now than I did when I sat down. It was just so much fun to work with those guys. And even a year later, uh, three of us were in um, Shutter Island as well. And uh, so um, the three of us and uh, Tony came to the premiere and we were all standing there with cocktails a year later at a different movie premiere. And it was like, dude, that was really fun. We have to figure out a way for the four of us to do something together because it was just too much fun. I mean, for you, if you're into it, right, it's a fun day and a half, but like, there has to be a point where you say like, well, when he says like, cut, that's a wrap, you're like, oh, we're, we're, we're done. Like it just, if, if you, you know what I mean? Like, you know, it's not this normal, like, okay, wide coverage, close up, close up, close up. We're out of there. You know what I mean? Like, mm -hmm. I don't know. Do you, do you, did you? Did you feel frustrated ever or were you just like, I'm lucky to be working with these guys. This is awesome. Or a take where like, you know, you fucking nailed it and everybody nailed it. And you're like, oh, Jesus. You know, I, I mean, I think one of the things that uh, Fincher beating you, beating you with the takes does also is, is it removes the director mind from your head completely. There's always a sense like when you're on a, most sets that you're going to get three shots at this. And you're good. You you have made choices at home, right? You have you have gotten a sense of what the material is, and you want to make sure that that those choices um, at least inform the take that you're going to get. You know, the three or four you're going to get, and then your 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 um, your acting partner informs everything that you chose at home. And hopefully if you're, uh, if you're alive, if you're an alive artist, that changes everything you do because you're playing with a partner. But, um, but in that it, with Fincher, you just stop thinking about how it looks or feels. You just start, you, you, it's like um, following uh, the, the energy of the scene from one, from one buffet to the other. And then you start to just ride the scene. At least that's the energy that I, I, I had and the other three people had there was just uh, it didn't feel like it was egoless that way it just didn't you know you know there was you were there to work with him you were there to work the way he works you're not there to do the work that you you know you're not there to do work without him you know he's not your adversary right I mean I think that people sometimes like I mean I've had directors who feel they're in ad they're adversarial to the actors and I've, I've been with actors in my, you know, brief periods of directing that definitely it felt like there was an adversarial relationship uh, to some degree. Um, and you have to earn things in that way because they don't know that they can trust you. But if you've watched Fincher's work for five minutes, you should understand you can trust him. He has extraordinary performances in every single film he's ever done. Why would you want to... Uh, why wouldn't you simply want to go, let's ride the boat where it's going and let's not spend a lot of time fighting the current. You can't push the river, man. It's not your river. Do you, do you have, like, what, what do you think your favorite, like, top three even Fincher movies are, or, or can you think of it that well, way? Well, I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a huge fan of The Game. <laughs> I love that movie, The Game. I love that movie. It's one that doesn't get a lot of love, and I just think that both, uh, Penn and uh, Michael Douglas are tremendous in the movie, and it's a really, really good movie. Um, and it it does everything. It 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 falls into madness, you know, um, uh, in such a beautiful way. Fight Club is also incredible. Uh, um, uh, I love those movies, um, um, and uh, I think that. Uh, Trying to think, Social Network is also great, but you know, um, well, going back and watching Mindhunter, the show, and again, I know it's a TV show, but to watch how he takes an interrogation room. I mean, essentially that's a series of interviews, that, that show. And yet in those circumstances, they're filled with such, um, uh, such amazing um, artistry in the way he edits and the way he shoots and the way in which 
he um, supports the performances and gets performances. They're incredible. So it's interesting you mentioned the game. Uh, I'm a fan of the game. It used to be on HBO, I think, a fair amount. Um, and considering, like, the stars at the time, it should have been bigger now that yeah. I think about it, right? Michael yeah. Douglas, Sean Penn, those are huge names at that time. I don't know oh, why yeah. that movie didn't oh, do yeah. well. I don't know what year that was. Well, it's, but... it's, it's a funny thing that you like when you look back over Fincher's career uh, and you look at the box office, there's a series of box office disappointments that later on lead to what were we thinking moments for everybody who ever sees them. I mean, uh, I, I, I mean, with the exceptions, I think Social Network was a big hit. I think that, you know, but Benjamin Button and, uh, and uh, Zodiac was, was a disappointment uh, in the box office. It was, you know, there were, there's just been a series of those. The Game, I think, was a disappointment at the box office. But people Seven was a huge hit. You right. know, Seven, Seven and he, the fact that he did Alien 3 and made a lot of money with it, I think those things gave him carte blanche to, to, to uh, make these big budgets and to create these massive tapestries. Well, um, the, the game actually makes me think of Shutter Island, right? Where upon multi yeah. multiple viewings, you get different, you get, and I think you and I talked about it a little bit when it first came out, but now it's been 10 years, which is amazing. Um, but um, if you haven't seen Shutter Island, go see it. And we're probably going to spoil it in the next couple of minutes. So you can pause now. Okay, great. You paused. Um, so the direction there, the direction for a movie like that, where, you know, it's, it's, we're trying, how am I trying to say this? How, we're, we're trying to not give it away, but upon second viewing, mm -hmm. we can tell you sort of are giving it away. Like what was, what was Marty's direction there? Well, I mean, his, his, uh, the way in which he, this is something I've learned uh, as I've been working on directing films and, uh, and the ones that the one that I did have directed so far and the ones that I want to direct are of, of a scope and magnitude that is far smaller than, um, than the amount of material uh, that uh, Shutter Island needs you to understand, right, as a director. Uh, and uh, you don't decide, oh, I'm going to start with Shutter Island. You know, that's that's not the way you do it. You, know? <laughs> you start with Mean Streets, and you, right. know, you start with you start with something, and then you go further and further into these kinds of techniques and asking questions that are bigger, not bigger than Mean Streets, but that are different than than that. And madness as a as a uh, as a as an organizing principle of your movie. Right to say I'm going to explore madness, and then find the techniques to do that. That's wild. And the idea that you can know when you're directing the actors, um, the 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 spirit that you want the scenes to be played in, um, that that will inform the truth of what's happening, that the audience isn't aware of until the very end. So you are playing against um, everything uh, that the, a regular narrative would ask you to do, which was to tell a story from the start. Right. Because you're not telling a story from the start. You're telling a story from the end. And then you're also going to work with your longtime editor who has, has been with you forever. And she's going to take your material and create um, disconnects. Uh, in it that for most film audiences would look like continuity errors, but in actuality are different states of being that the character is experiencing and that there, that you're sudden, you suddenly realize that something that looks like an overall narrative is actually a first person narrative. Um, that's what he's doing in the movie, you know, to get really weedy. But at my level, like showing up to play Deputy Warden McPherson, right? I only need to know, I mean, I, I get that from the material because I've read the material, but I need to know what my, you know, I, like, if you think of it like an orchestra, I only need to know the oboe part, man. That's all I need to know is the oboe right, part. Right, but you're still, but you're still, I feel like, playing it in a way that's believable both ways, right? Or mm -hmm. try to, like, I feel like that would be difficult. Yeah. Well, that's where the tuning comes in, you know, where uh, that's the way in which he talked to, to me and to other people about the way in which he, uh, I would play the scenes. And 
you know, this guy, you know, if you're, if you're looking at it at the level when you first meet Deputy Warden McPherson, he is a nonplussed individual. He has seen it all, you know, he's not going to, he is, I mean, he's even, he's even shot like a door. And I, I mean, you know, my daddy wasn't a glass maker. I'm a big man. So, so the idea that he uses my physical frame to look like an un, immovable object and that uh, Richardson shoots it that way, that, you know, uh, I mean, that's the way he, that's why he's a great filmmaker because he can use every aspect of it from the way in which people are cast to the, to the material that he uses in the, you know, the actual equipment that he uses to make the story work. And, um, he's a nonplussed individual, right? He's, you know, he's, he's seen it all before. And then you, you, at the end of the movie, you go, Oh no, he really has seen it all before. Right. He's seen it all before. Right. And, and that's the revelation is that you only, you only need to play one thing and then it has two meanings. It's, you know, that movie is essentially the, the cabinet of Dr. Caligari. I don't know that. Was that, that play? Oh man, watch that movie. It's a silent film. It's a German expressionist movie. You can watch it on the Criterion Collection. Sounds sounds it, thrilling, by the way, to most of my audience, probably. <laughs> I I know you're gonna love it. I mean, German expressionism, man. It's awesome. <laughs> um, but that it's essentially the island of Dr. Car. I mean, the 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 cabinet of Dr. Caligari, and it's amazing how similar it was. And when I watched that movie. You know, I'm trying to think. I don't even think I saw that movie before I saw Shutter Island. And I finished it and I go, it's fucking Shutter Island, man. That's what it is. You think you know what you're watching and you don't know what you're watching. And then the filmmaker flips flips it over in your mind and you just go. Right. Although I think I told you I did figure it out pretty early on. But it didn't, it didn't ruin it for me. I just kind of saw where it was going. Well, I mean, that's the, that can be the joy too, right? That you know there's a bomb underneath the table. Oh. I mean, both things can work. Right. I mean, and again, it's still, it's still watchable, right? Because, you know, you've got, you've got Leo, you've got Ruffalo, you've got fucking, what's his name? Sir, uh, what's uh, his name? Ben Kingsley. Sir ben, Max von Sydow, for God's right. sake. R.I.P. Max von Sydow. We just lost him. Yeah, we did. What a bummer. Yeah. <laughs> so I was on the set of that movie and, um, I was freaking out for the first three days because uh, uh, because it was Martin Scorsese and I'd met him at the audition and everything, but I was just freaking out because I, I like I couldn't get it out of my mind. Like you know, you have a like a like a canker sore in your mouth and you can't stop touching it. That's how it felt. Like I knew exactly where he was on the set. It was really freaking me out. Like it didn't feel like I was making a movie. It's like, uh, yeah, Martin Scorsese is is right behind me. You know, at seven thirty, and I turned. Yep, sure enough, he's there. And you like I knew that. exactly where he was. And you got that all out of your system for Clint. So by the time you get to Clint, it was like, whatever. Pretty much. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> so, uh, and also it's a different set, you know, cause you're going to be acting with Eastwood. So you don't have a choice, you know, you can't, you can't do that. You've got to play with him. So you can't do that too. Right. But so I finally, like the third day I was like, you just like, I remember, like I said to myself at home when I was getting in, get, you know, when I was at the hotel, I was like, get a hold of yourself, man. <laughs> you, you've made these movies before. You've made movies before. Stop it. So I was uh, sitting on the set and uh, I hear Marty go, John. And I realized I didn't know where he was. I was like, what? Oh, this is great. I'm making a movie now. Right. And then I had, I split, the, the day was split. So I did the first scene and then I did the second scene and they did a scene in between because the uh, night fell in the midst of the, uh, of the characters being inside. So um, now I'm on set at two in the morning and I'm sitting, uh, uh, Marty has me, listen, you're going to be, uh, uh, we've got a speaker in the car and uh, Bob's going to be, uh, Bob's going to be shooting uh, Leo and Mark in the backseat and you're a piece, you're, you're, you're represented by a piece of tape on the windshield. And as they pull out, you know, what you're going to do is you're going to play the scene here on this microphone and you'll be watching on the monitor. He said, that's great. So I'm sitting next to him and I'm looking over the sides, which I hadn't seen since uh, you know the morning just to make sure i had it and in walks max von Sydow, and i just i was like i can't be on the set with max von Sydow. That's right not, no right no there should always be a screen he should only be in two dimensions in my life i can't have him in three dimensions it's too much for me right. so i tried to go over 
to talk to him. And I just literally, I could not put a sentence together. It was the, I, it was the most ridiculously fumbled introduction and it was horrific. I mean, I still have social anxiety thinking about it. And I go back over to the seat and I'm shaking my head and Scorsese looks over me and then he looks at what I'm shaking my head about and he goes, I know, what do you say to the guy? I mean, <laughs> did, did you say, does Bergman make you stand behind a car like this? I don't know. What you say. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah, it was pretty that's, great. That's great. Well, I was going to say, if it ever occurred to you to be like, you know, to go up to him and say, listen, uh, I'm sure you get this all the time, but it's just going to humanize me if I can just tell you X, Y, Z, and now I can go back to being, you know, an actor. I want to do great for you. Or do you think if that's just, I had, that's that just bad? That would have been really a great, that would have been a really great strategy in comparison to what I did, which was like, yeah. yeah. I, I meant, mean, I, I meant I, to Marty, actually. I meant to Scorsese to oh, do that. Oh, even to Marty. Oh, I don't know. You know, I guess that could have been something, but I'd already met him, you know? Right. It's not, I'd already had that experience right. with the audition. I'd already auditioned for him. All right. So, so is there, is there someone left for you? Is there, is there, I don't know, do you, uh, have you worked with Woody Allen? Would you want to work for him? Have you worked with, I don't know who, who's on your short list? Of well, like, okay. I have a feeling that Mr. Allen's going to have trouble getting financing well, for a while. I, I would say I, bad uh, choice, yeah. but you get what I'm saying. Yeah. yeah. I mean, there are people out there that I would love to work with, obviously. Um, um, Alex Garland, who I think is tremendously talented. I will, I will, if Karin Kusama asks me to, to serve coffee, I'll do it. I think she's tremendous. Um, uh, Ava DuVernay is spectacularly good. I mean, there's, there's a bunch of people out there who are masters at the craft, you know, and, uh, and I would love to work, uh, uh for them and with them. And, uh, but, but it's a different feeling now than it would have been, you know, at, you know, it's, it's now my, I did my first film as an extra when I was 20 years old. Um, I did uh, Tin Men. Uh, I was an extra in Tin Men in Baltimore. Classic. The, yeah. Yeah. And, uh, um, you know, I, that was the first set I was on and it was, it was, it was freaky, you know, to have, you know, Danny DeVito and Bruno Kirby and, uh, and Richard Dreyfus walk by, you know. Uh, but now I've done readings with uh, with Richard Dreyfus and had drinks with Danny DeVito, and and it's a different feeling of being, right. you know, twenty six years, uh, thirty six years later. You know, it's a it's a different feeling now, and um, and uh, and all for the better for the work because of course you can't work in a position where you're not going to play with someone you can't can't work in that position you have to be willing to play with people and I, and I, and i think that one of the things that's fundamental is uh when when i was freaking out about the scorsese thing the main thing i said to myself was this is what you always dreamed of right this is this is the position you want to be in you know it's like somebody who's going into the nfl uh you know that's that's the thing they dreamed of from the very first time they didn't they didn't dream they were going to fail in the nfl right they would dream they were going to succeed so they but goddamn was well do it you know uh, i wanted to talk to you about uh one of my wife and i's favorite shows possibly ever is uh is the americans and i, I can't remember if you and i talked at all when it when it came out or when it happened um I think I saw you after I did that. Uh, I was last time I saw you in physical, physically was I think I was in Atlanta a few years after I did that. I think we had like coffee or whatever, but I don't know if it came up. No, I think you were in Atlanta when you were doing that show in New Orleans. That was like 2010 or 11. Oh well, then that was wow. It's even further. Right. Even um, longer. Okay. Uh, but anyhow, um, I don't. Know, what season was that? I want to say the third to fourth were, season were you watching like the show that's what i was going to ask if you were watching the i was show watching the show uh, i'm a first season kind of guy you know i'll watch a show for one season and then i'll watch another show i loved the show um i, I loved the show there was nothing i mean and the quality of the show continued uh, throughout those three the three main actors and and the people that they hired to join them uh uh over the course of the show were extraordinary. The Russian actors that they hired were amazing. And, but Carrie, Carrie Russell and Matthew 
and Noah, I mean, such a, a, a fantastic central core of players um, that are eminently watchable. Um, so, you know, I watched the show at the beginning. When I, when I was asked to be a part of it for a period of time, I think it was, they told me I'd be doing five or six episodes of the show if I, if I said yes. Um, I, I didn't know what was going on in the show at that point. Because you know? you'd stopped watching. Yeah, because I, you know, because I was on to something else. Um, uh, I don't know why I just watch. I think sometimes, and it's wrong about that show, by the way. I think sometimes I watch the first season and go, that was amazing. And then I, I, I tune into the second season and I was like, oh, they've told the story that I, I liked. I liked the story they already told, so I don't need another one. <laughs> There's also so many good shows on now. You know, it's, we're in a, we're in a no, plethora. I, listen, I'm, in, I'm in agreement with you. I just think that was one that, that is an all-timer. It is. I mean, it is. And it's one, a one a, a yet another circumstance in which um, it's not given its due, I don't think. Well, I mean, I think at the time, people who watched television were like, don't you think? Well, I mean, I, I mean eventually, it, it eventually it did. But, it, you know, it's the qual. It has, from beginning to end, the season, the, the, I've subsequently watched episodes from all the seasons. I haven't watched all of them. Uh, is it, its quality is as high throughout as Breaking Bad's quality is as high. And uh, just the zeitgeist is that Breaking Bad is, you know, considered, you know, uh, by not just by, uh, you know, people who do this for a living or people who love this, but by the general public as an, ad an adored show. And, um, and Americans is like, oh, I got to get to, I got to watch that, man. I've heard it's really good. Right. Well, the, 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 the phrase that comes up for me is like, why do I like these like certain, certain shows and what, what happens with, with misses, right? Like the ones that don't do it, like a couple seasons and goes a different direction or whatever. And the word that I keep coming back to is, is stakes. So Breaking Bad was able to keep the stakes up here all the fucking time. Right. Mm -hmm. With, you know, newer bad guys or different forces, right? And I think Americans was able to do that too. And um, we're watching Homeland right now, my wife and I. Love it, love it, love it. Didn't think I would. Didn't really like the first season. Um, had issues with what's his name, actually. Um, <laughs> what's his name? <laughs> Mandy Patinkin? No, Mandy's amazing. And so is she. It's the, what's his name? Oh, oh, Damian Lewis? Yes. And it's, it, it's funny, I actually thought if they'd made it 10 years before, they would have used uh, Noah, I think. I felt kind of, I thought like they, they mm, like, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. But anyhow, is that when you've got, when you can keep raising the stakes and keep the <gasps> moments, like, of course the acting, you know, is incredible and the story, but that's to me is like, the writing is so impressive. It's like, it's well, I think so that amazing. What you just, yeah, that's the word that, that's the word that makes the difference in television is the writing, the consistency, the consistent quality of writing and the understanding of the story they're telling. And the fact that they, they know that the story, like <clears throat> episodic television is very hard because you don't know how long your story is gonna be, right? So, so you have to have a sense of what your story, overall story is, and then you have to have some play in it to, um, to uh, allow for, you know, your, let's say, 13 chapter story to become a 26 chapter story. And um, I mean, it's not unlike a Dickens novel, right? I mean, Dickens wrote, uh, you've got monthly installments of Dickens novels when they first came out. They were monthly serials. They weren't a big thing. And he didn't know how long the magazine was gonna let him go. So he had to keep you interested without betraying the, the central characters. And I think that that is the hardest thing on earth to do is to continually, continually um, keep this, as you described the stakes, but also keep the story moving forward with just enough momentum without betraying your, your characters, your, the individual characters that you, um, that you have come to invest yourself in as an audience member. And the minute they betray the characters, the minute the characters are betrayed, they, you know, it's like, oh, this is a TV show, which means they don't have to watch it anymore. 
<laughs> well, I think um, the the idea of like the old idea of the cliffhanger, right? Yeah. I feel yeah. like we, we've gotten smarter as writers that every episode does not need a cliffhanger, right? We can just say, this is where we are. Come back yes. tomorrow. And, yes. you know, uh, this whole concept of streaming, right, has changed everything. Everything. And what I like to well, do look is... At, well, just, ahead, real, just real quickly. Yeah. If you... If you rewatch, so let's take the most obvious one for me. Let's take The Sopranos, something I've watched multiple, multiple times, right? Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, season three ends, boom, season four. And there's these different themes or different tones. And to try to remember what it was like when you've been a year away from these characters or a year and a half in some cases, it was so, because we were like, we could not wait. And it's like, some of that's kind of missing, right? The go to sleep and wake up seven days later. You've talked about it with a friend. Did you see last night's episode? And so we've kind of lost that, right? And so I try to quickly, when, I, when we're watching, uh, what do you call it? So we're watching Homeland now, and I, I try not to read too much because it'll give stuff away, but like, okay, how much time was actually happened in real life, right? This was between 12 and 13, so a year had passed, and let's try to settle into what has happened because it's you're not a very just, sophisticated watcher well i try to i'm not always good at it but i try yeah. to um because again it's like it's eight seconds later right episode mm -hmm. season four season one and you're like if you get eight seconds now like sometimes they only give you three like tick 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 that oh, we're on to the next one we know you want to watch it we've got to keep you here we got to keep come on watch some more watch some more jesus christ man what are you watching these circumstances? What are you watching um, these days? I just started watching. I started watching uh, Parks and Recreation from the beginning because I hadn't watched that show from okay. the beginning, and I'm very much enjoying that. Uh, I just finished watching some. Uh, I'm I'm on to Devs. I think maybe I'm on a Nick Offerman kick. That's pro probably partly why I'm doing that. Okay. Um, uh, and uh, along with that, uh, um, what else am I watching? Oh, you know, I'll watch Westworld. Because I think that that show is that show has. I mean, it 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 it. It's, I struggled in the second season, as I think the writers did, in my experience of uh, keeping all the balls in the air. Right. So we'll see what happens. I, but 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 they've earned they've earned my trust for another, you know, uh, another few seasons. And the first episode was was uh, was uh, perfectly arranged. Uh, the way in which it, ca it captures, it wants you to move forward with the story. Oh, so, and the, the thing that I thought was fantastic was Watchmen. I thought that was one of the best seasons of television I've seen in a long time. I will give that one a look. I have not watched that. Um, I am working, uh, if you remember, I work in this obstacle racing space. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. there are currently no races. Everything's been postponed or canceled. Uh, it's, yeah. it's, 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 as much as everybody's been affected, it's definitely not. It's definitely hurting the events industry big time. Um, oh yeah. In your world, and you know that's a that's a that's a. I'm sure that'll get a bailout. <laughs> right. Yes. Definitely. Definitely getting a. Bailout. I'm sure the convention business for you know for horror conventions will also get a bailout. Exactly. Exactly. Ex 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 well. Do you get invited to those? Yeah. Do you do you go? Yeah, I go when I can. Yeah. Um, have you ever come to Dragon Con? That's the big one here. No, I've not been to Dragon Con. If you ever come, we'll grab a coffee. Oh yeah, we'll we'll have a drink. It's a, it's a, it's a, not it's a drink, but we'll, it's a big we'll one have here. A meal. Um, yeah. So in your world, um, was it, um, you know, everything that was shooting just stopped? Like, how did it affect the uh, oh, yeah. the inner? Just like literally, Same like, thing. all right, buddy, go home. I was uh, I was in Albuquerque, New Mexico, uh, uh, to prep for. Uh, a new uh, series on ABC that's going straight to series, gratefully, because it still has an opportunity to to continue. Uh, it's a, a C.J. Box uh, story uh, from one of his books called The Highway. David Kelly optioned the material and turned it into a television show called The Big Sky. And uh, we were in our prep week. We did uh, on you know, Monday the cast came in, I did my fitting, we, we had discussions with the director, et cetera. Then on you know, Tuesday, we had a cast reading, uh, did our, you know, sexual harassment and harassment and discrimination seminars, which are absolutely crucial to everything we do in the film and television industry now. 
and hopefully every. Oh, can we wait a minute? Can we can we talk about that? Sure. They sit down day one and and say what? Well, they give you an indication of what the law is around uh, harassment and discrimination, which are which are um, siblings, you know. And um, and they give you a, a a rundown of what your response rights and responsibilities are inside the corporate apparatus that's that's hired you, and what your what you're supposed to do if you are harassed or you feel discriminated against, uh, and uh, what will happen if you are a perpetrator of harassment or discrimination. And it's based on each individual state's law, not based on you know the industry necessarily. Like we were under New Mexico law, so the the the, the presentation was slightly tailored uh, to that as opposed to California, as opposed to Georgia, as opposed to you know, and it goes on and on and on. But but each uh, every single year, every single show um, that you're hired on as a regular, to you get this seminar. And it, do you feel in the people you've spoke with, specifically women, feel like this is a real thing or well they're doing this just like you have to you know do a osha speech or do they feel like it means something well i mean it's an interesting set of circumstances um i think that uh i, I mean i i uh, in some ways i asked that question you know what what the intention of the apparatus is obviously the insurance company would like them to have it because uh because they're going to be on the hook for any you know civil damages based on the behavior of the people that are being hired. And, and uh, the corporate apparatus would like to have it because they also want to make sure that, uh, that they share the blame with you if you are a perpetrator of these behaviors. But uh, also, it's the right thing to do. So it kind of lines up in a really nice way in that, you know, uh, you know note to self, you know, uh, you know, tr- treat people like human beings and treat, you know, and make sure that you, you know, don't shit where you eat essentially. And, uh, and, uh, you know, I, I think that that's a, I think that's a fair understanding. I don't, I don't have any problem with those things lining up. They can all be the same, you know, the motivations can all be, um, the same, but to understand that there are conflicts of interest inside those motivations, you know, that they're not on your side, you know, the, the network is not on your side by giving you these things, but they are on the side of the people who are going to be, harassed or going to be discriminated against and they need to be for both uh, ethical reasons but also legal reasons and financial reasons it all lines up so was it okay we'll we'll let you know we're all at a standstill or there's a tentative june 1st date to come back or is there what what does everybody do well what happened was uh we finished our camera tests and then on wednesday i was like i wonder if we're actually going to start because you know the night before the whole world shut down you know the uh on wednesday night the nba suspended its uh its uh season and uh, and uh tom and rita got sick you know which was a big deal that they were sick and uh especially do we, do we know them by first industry. name do we do we are we casual with tom and Rita? oh yeah oh i think tom and Rita. i think everybody knows who tom and Rita. <laughs> i think we do i don't think we need to uh i'm not, i you know i've only met him a couple of times uh working for him years ago i and i worked with her once uh what, on what a, did you work with him on episode. uh from the earth to the moon he directed me in an episode of from the earth to the moon um when he was making that with playtone i think that'll give you an understanding of who this tom is <laughs> Let's call him Tom. <laughs> I don't know where you know Marty, yeah. Rita, and Tom. You know Bobby De Niro. Yeah, I just like I, you know want to make you know, Bobby. Um, anyway, um, anyway, the the uh, uh, you know when they got sick in Australia, when uh, the Hanks and uh, Wilson family got sick in uh, Australia, they got they got sick on a set, right? You know that he was about to start work as Colonel Tom Parker. And so um, all of a sudden, you know, it's, it's the industry is being affected directly. Hang, hang on one second. Brief interruption. They're making a movie about Elvis in Australia? Baz Luhrmann. The is Australian he, is, director is making a, a, a movie about Elvis. Okay. And so Baz was like, we'll do it in Australia. Well, where, where else are you going to do it? <laughs> I mean, you know, you're going to come, come down here. We're going to make Atlanta. It's going to be great. We're going to make Nashville. 
It's going to be terrific. You're going to love it. Terrific. <laughs> Great. It's going to look just like it. You're going to look just like Tom Parker. It's going to be fantastic. Give you the mustache. That was a terrible Australian accent. No, I thought it was pretty good. It's pretty, most people. Uh, when I, I got to work, you know. I, when I start, when I usually roll right into the English, and then you can't escape it. So I think that was. Well, I, think, um, I use a I use a a, a line from uh, um, when I want to do an Australian accent. I use a line from uh, um, uh, Road Warrior to get into it, which is uh, which is two days ago. I saw a rig that could hold that tanker. You want to get out of here? You got to talk to me. <laughs> and that's so, the way you do all accents, by the way. You try to get something because you're you're in charge of it, right? Right. So you try to get something that you can do just before you start working. Like right. I have a whole I have a whole paragraph in Pittsburgh Ease that I wrote so I could get into it for the show I did one dollar because that accent is so tricky. Right. Uh... <laughs> But anyway, the whole world shut down, right? We'll go back to the original conversation. The whole world shut down. And then I was like, I think we're going to probably shut down. And by Friday, we were. They sent us home and they postponed until mid-June, if mid-June comes along. And I certainly hope it does. For all concerned, I hope it does. Not just for my selfish reasons, but for the whole world. Because, you know, what we're looking at may last a hell of a lot longer than mid-June. Uh, correct. I don't know if I'll make it. I have three kids. Um, it's five people in a house. It's not a huge house. I mean, it's, you know, we got five bedrooms, but it's one floor. Um, can I quickly say, speaking of Baz Lorman, and then we, we can wrap up. Um, I never quite uh, understood the fascination with, um, oh, what's that movie that everybody loves? <laughs> Moulin Rouge? Yes. Uh, Romeo and Juliet? Moulin Rouge. Okay. People yeah. spoke about it like this was amazing, uh, and I was like, I, 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 I kind of don't, I kind of don't see it. Um, <laughs> I mean, you know, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna become a massive advocate for Moulin Rouge. You know, that there's, it's, he has a particular way of doing his movies. It's always true. It was true of Australia too, which I, my wife and I adored Australia, loved it. But everybody was like, that's a terrible movie. And I, I got to admit, it probably is. Yeah, it probably is. But I loved it. Yeah, I didn't at the time. I thought everyone was was everyone was overacting. <laughs> I mean, I get that with a musical. Well, I mean, that's he likes that though. He wants you to. I mean, he insists on it. He like, insists. Like, he pushes. He obviously has to push people for that. Like, like I get with a musical. There's a bit of that sort of camp. But anyway, I thought it missed the mark. I just want to go on record. I know it was oh, important well. in my John Carroll Lynch interview I, I, to get on the record that I'm not a Moulin Rouge fan. Yes, I, I'm glad that you did because now, you know, uh, I'll never be able to overact for Baz Luhrmann. Thanks very much, Matt. I, I don't think that's that. going to happen. <laughs> so how many, well, other, um, I, um, how many other things did, did you have anything else in the, in the hopper? Well, um, sometime this year, depending on when theaters open up again, uh, the trial of the Chicago seven will come out. It's an Aaron Sorkin directed and written piece. Uh, with an amazing cast of like uh, Sasha Baron Cohen and Eddie Redmayne and Frank Langella and Mark Rylance and oh, wow. um, um, Joseph Gordon-Levitt and Michael Keaton and uh, um, who are you? you know, just goes the cast goes on and on. I play a character named Dave Dellinger, who is one of the eight people uh, um, who were uh, on trial uh, in the Chicago Seven. The eighth person of the Chicago Seven is Bobby Seal, who's played fantastically by. Yaya Abdul Mateen, who I who uh, who has become, um, I, I'm I really love his work and loved working with him. There, there was a there was I remember seeing one on HBO back in the day. Did you ever see that one? You know what I'm talking about? Yeah, 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 yeah. With B Peter Boyle, I'm playing the Peter Boyle part. Not surprisingly, <laughs> <laughs> because you have similar hairlines. No, because we're you know uh, uh, we look like Dave Dellinger. Both of us look like Dave Dellinger. And that's and they're like, let's let's go with that. Yeah, let's go with that. Well, listen, I think this went great. Yeah, I liked it. It was fun. I enjoyed it very much. It was a fun time. And I, I hope you're able to uh fill your uh fill your time with this until you're you're back to your regular regularly scheduled programming. Well, I, I have to say that I'm I'm fortunate in that I'm you know, I'm, I'm a journalist. I'm a, I'm a podcaster. I'm a person who can do things digitally and kind of from wherever. 
Um, mm-hmm. So I feel really lucky in that regard. Um, I, mm-hmm. But that that doesn't mean I don't want uh, everybody else to get back to work. And like, I am going to eventually need more advertising dollars. So, um, uh, but yeah, this has been, I, I've been, I've been able to pump out a ton of content, which is great. So is, is there anything That's you want good. people, is there anything like, I don't know if you have any sort of Instagram you like people to support or any cause? Um, you shout well, out right to? now, right now uh, I'm on uh, Instagram and Twitter, Mr. JC Lynch, Mr. JC Lynch on both of those. I don't really follow, I don't really do fake Facebook, even though I have a Facebook page. Most of my content comes from Instagram when I do have that on there, but those are fine. And uh, I, I enjoy, I enjoy those things uh, when I'm, when I'm wasting time. Uh, but other than that, I, you know, I can't think of anything other than, you know, I, I want everybody to try to stay safe and uh, try to crush the curve, man. Uh, this is a very dangerous time and uh, there's going to be, you know, I'd rather, I'd rather be uh, South Korea than Italy. And we have a choice in that. You know? uh, I concur. You, uh, I'm finding you here on IG. You do have a blue check mark, which means you're a legit actual person. Huge I deal. Am verified. Yes. You are verified. Um, that's, that's impressive. Thank you. Thank you. I, we've been doing uh, Michael Gaston, a wonderful actor who I, I've known on and off of for a long while. He started a thing called read a sonnet, uh, hashtag read a sonnet. And it's really been great to watch people of all stripes, uh, read various sonnets, mostly from Shakespeare, but from, you know, Elizabeth Barrett Browning and a bunch of other people too. It's been very cool. Um, I, I think that's great. When you said Rita Sonnet, I think you th- I thought you were saying a name, a woman named Rita, last name Sonnet, uh, because yes, yes. because Rita Wilson changed her name to Sonnet. to Rita because nowadays who knows what a sonnet is, right? Yeah, that's right. That's right. right. Who knows? Maybe I'll take on your Rita Sonnet challenge. Absolutely, cool. Enjoy that. And I've got to go. I'm sorry to say. Oh no, dude. We we're wrapping up anyway. Thanks, buddy. Talk cool. soon. I'll send you a link when take it's care. up. All right, bye. Look forward to it. Bye.